Hello and welcome to Saving Lives in Slow Motion. Today, I'd like to talk about travel and tropical health. Now, I've probably timed this badly because most people are not away at this time of year and they've been on summer holidays if you're that way inclined or if you've got the means. Um, and some people might be going away for work or other reasons and a lot of people travel a lot of the time anyway. Now I have a, an interest in this, uh, not clinically particularly, but because I got very ill whilst travelling um, with a couple of friends back in 1993, so about 30 years ago. And although I, you know, we'd taken basic precautions, which I'm going to go through later on and talk a little bit about the perils of getting ill when you're traveling. Um, I ended up with something called dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is um, life-threatening actually. And I was in hospital for two weeks, really, really ill. And my platelets, which is the, the constituent of your blood that helps you clot and clump together, um, were, were really depleted. And I needed a platelet transfusion out in Malaysia to help me recover and then I was not right really for about six months. I was at medical school at the time but um, I'd lost a lot of weight and I, I wasn't feeling great. I was quite low and yeah struggled quite a lot, really fatigued as well after it. Now when we think of travel health we um, often think of simple things like diarrheal disease um, and possibly tropical diseases but one of the things that is arguably the most important thing is safety and the world at the moment is is full of unrest and it's easy for travelers to just get caught up in acts of terrorism war or something environmental which is out of control you know in terms of it's almost like an act of god in some ways as it's occasionally classified in insurance documents and I think the, the time it really hit me was on this same trip, actually, where I got very ill. Um, we had, three of us had basically headed to Thailand, done the whole traveller thing, and were working our way up to Malaysia. But on the way, we met lots of travellers, and there was one guy who'd been travelling for 20 years, I think. And he said one of the things for us to look out for was death by coconut. And we didn't believe him at first, but apparently about 75 travellers a year get killed by coconuts um, falling out of trees onto their heads. Not the kind of thing you're thinking about when you're booking a holiday or a, or a trip, but nevertheless important. So let's start with the common things that we need to be aware of. So gut problems are almost, I say inevitable, but they're something that a lot of travellers suffer with you know and there are so many geographical names for this montezuma's revenge or deli belly or a jippy tummy which um jippy i'm told refers to egypt and you'll often find your local pharmacy will have adverts during holiday season saying we can treat travelers diarrhea so i went to one local pharmacy who was extremely busy uh, and asked about traveller's diarrhoea and actually the, the pharmacist said I can't do it now because I'm just too busy and I said no no I don't actually want it I just wanted to know what you give for it and it was an antibiotic actually called rifaximin which which I know to be used for SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth which I talk about in other episodes particularly my gut symptoms episode but it's at a lower dose and I, I didn't know it was licensed for that and certainly pharmacologically and pharmaceutically, the way in which a doctor or a pharmacist would approach this traveller's diarrhoea will be to prescribe an antibiotic to prevent it, if you like. But there are steps before that, of course, making sure that you only drink bottled or filtered water that's definitely gone through some kind of filtering process. The other one, which is obvious again, is not to have ice, um, because often the ice wherever you are, especially if you're in a part of the world where the drinking water is likely not to be of, of good quality, the ice is going to be made from standard water supply um, and avoiding things like salads and too much uncooked food because if these foods are left 
out in warm environments, you know, hot countries, uh, they're more likely to be contaminated with harmful bacteria. I do want to just, you know, give you a slightly depressing stat on diarrhoea. It is still the cause of death of around about half a million children a year. And that's down to dehydration. And when you rehydrate, and this is one of the things that's so important in parts of the world where this still sadly happens, water does not rehydrate us chemically. So important to understand this. It's a mixture of water, salt and sugar. And actually, if you're adding other minerals in like zinc, that works even more effectively. So it's not something to um, take lightly. I'm not saying you should be alarmed if you have it if you're traveling uh, there are other things you can do there are probiotics that you can take there's one in particular called saccharomyces boulardii that supports the lining the inner lining the mucosal interface of the gut and helps to support an appropriate immune response through something called secretory iga so if you went to a health store for example one of the things they may offer you is that as a preventative for traveler's diarrhea or, or maybe another probiotic so there's a role for probiotics okay what else that was diarrhea or getting a, an upset tummy mosquitoes really important now it's funny in, in, over the summer i went to thailand and i we were really cautious we were using something on our skin to repel mosquitoes you know wherever we went whether that was citronella or something pretty heavy with chemicals in it and actually we didn't really get any bites i went to france um much more recently and got bitten everywhere um and i was thinking this is weird because mosquitoes tend to be attracted to warmer climates which are humid and actually where they tend to inhabit the planet is increasing because of global warming because they tend to love water and, you know, if you look at the map of malaria, which is the most serious thing that you can get from being bitten by a mosquito, it's like a big belt that goes around the world, around its middle, um, mainly around the equator. But that belt is also increasing in size vertically. Now, again, malaria is so horrific in a way because again that can lead to death and again around that sort of half a million a year these are tragic in a way because some argue that actually malaria has been underfunded in terms of research compared to other diseases and I don't want to get into the politics of it but the good news is that there is now a vaccine and you know whatever your views on vaccines are I'm going to sound contentious here, but, you know, if you're not affected by malaria, particularly, and you're living in a part of the world where it doesn't really exist, you're probably not going to care too much about this. But if you live somewhere where it's endemic and you have lost a family member or a child, then suddenly it's really critical that something is done to make sure that these deaths don't happen. Okay, so I don't want to get bogged down too much on this. Other hazards to your health when it comes to travel include things like altitude sickness if you're climbing, so that is something that needs special treatment. Then you've got things like giardia and hepatitis A, which you get from infected water sources. And then there's something called schistosomiasis, which can give you bilharzia, which is um, a kind of an illness that makes you feel really fatigued. And you get this from swimming in contaminated fresh water so a lot of people do that on holiday and actually that one is is something that's known as a neglected tropical disease because they don't get as much attention compared to bigger more prominent diseases like tuberculosis or malaria or hiv and aids other things that pop into my mind deep vein thrombosis if you're flying a lot beware of that it's all important to kind of keep your circulation going if you're on a long-haul flight make sure that you get up and stretch and move around wiggle your toes or wear stockings as well and so many other things like prickly heat sunstroke and actually sunburn really important to make sure that that doesn't happen because of the risk to your skin um, of skin cancers i think it's safe to say that 
travel and tropical health, there is an overlap between them. But if you have a tropical disease, like when I had dengue fever, it's not always that straightforward to diagnose unless you are used to seeing that kind of condition frequently. So actually, I initially sought help from two local doctors in northern Thailand. I had flu-like symptoms. I was feeling terrible, but much worse than I'd ever felt before. I could barely walk, you know, I couldn't carry my backpack or anything. But it wasn't really until I'd got to a hospital, you know, across the border in Malaysia, when a very astute doctor really sort of looked at my symptoms and then found these really tiny patches, which you couldn't really see with the naked eye, where I was bleeding into my skin. So if you do become unwell with symptoms that are not improving or it's not obvious, you do need help from someone who is an expert in those slightly rarer conditions that we don't see every day. Having said that, in parts of the UK, in big cities, we see quite a lot of malaria, certainly in parts of London, because the population is so international and there's so much travelling going on. And we're very lucky, I think, because there are two centres of excellence for tropical disease in the UK, one in London and one in Liverpool. And I've had patients that have been to the one in London with mystery illnesses, and it's, it's just incredible the amount of resource and expertise they have to chase down a mystery diagnosis. The bottom line when you're travelling is watch what you eat, try not to get bitten, and make sure that you don't swim somewhere that is likely to harbour lots of bacteria. I know that sounds awful because it's so romantic sometimes to just jump into a lake in the middle of a gorgeous foreign land, but beware. It's quite hard because sometimes you think, well, hang on, everyone else is doing it. Why shouldn't I do it? But it's always safety and health first. Okay, that was travel and tropical medicine in 10, 12 minutes. There's loads of links that are useful on this episode and I do hope you look at them because it will give you a bit more information uh, in terms of deep dive on some of the topics that I've covered quickly there. Thank you again for listening. I hope that was useful. Do keep sending in your ideas. I really love listening to them and I am working my way through them. Any of them that are doable, I will do. And find me on socials, on Instagram, on Twitter and on LinkedIn, and of course my Facebook page, where you'll see other kinds of content from me, which is a bit of a mishmash. And until next time, do stay well, take care, look after yourself. Bye for now.